Thank you for joining us. Um, thank you for joining us for our first quarterly um, big event Richie meeting. Um, just a quick uh, update. We're going to be changing our format from here on out for Richie and meeting um, quarterly and having um, speakers present. And um, we'll be disseminating more information on our structure um, in January. So thank you for joining us. Uh, today we have Dr. Janine Young speaking. She is a general pediatrician at Denver Health and Hospitals and an associate professor at the University of Colorado School of Medicine, the Department of General Peds. She was an undergrad at Columbia University and received her medical training at Harvard School of Medicine. Um, she uh, completed her residency training at the Boston Combined Program and UCSF Benef School uh, Children's Hospital, Oakland. Her career focus is healthcare and access to care for immigrants and refugees. She's written widely and presented talks nationally regarding topics that include the development of standards of care uh, for immigrant medical screening guidelines, female genital cutting, evaluation and treatment of unaccompanied children, and medical immigration law collaboration. She is the medical director of the Denver Health Refugee Clinic and co-medical director of the Human Rights Clinic at Denver Health. She is a grantee working with the Minnesota Development, Department of Public Health and the Centers for Disease Control to develop um, newcomers centers for ex newcomer centers for excellence. She is one of uh, she's on the executive committee of the American Academy of Pediatrics Council of Immigrant Child and Family Health, and on the boards of the Society of Refugee Health Providers and the Colorado Chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics. She's a certified Spanish and French medical interpreter and loves to travel and get away from it all whenever she can. Oh, yes. Janine, thank you so much. Hey, thank, thanks a lot. Um, so, and I appreciate the invitation, Meenal. Um, so let me just get these slides to advance. Hmm. There we go. Um, this is just acknowledgements of the funding that I receive. Um, so basically the goals are, and it sounds like everyone already works with um, immigrants and refugees. So I'll briefly just review those definitions, but also um, focus on unaccompanied children. A little bit of brief US arrival data. Um, and then the goal is really to present patient cases from my hospital system, Denver Health, um, that I've seen over the years that highlight infectious diseases, micronutrient deficiencies, environmental hazards, cultural practices that are more common in some of the immigrant populations that we all take care of. Um, <clears throat> also, I'm gonna review available epidemiologic data on screening recommendations, what exists, what doesn't, where there are gaps and where there really needs to be more work. And I'm also gonna share some user-friendly tools and resources to make your job easier to perform appropriate screening of your immigrant patients, whether they've been here for a week or for 10 years. So from that, I will um, go from there. So we all know that there's the UN definition of refugee from the 1953 convention, um, which has been adopted by the US as a legal definition to give legal status to a certain subgroup of immigrants. Um, and so they have to prove that they're unable or unwilling to return to their country of origin, owing to a well-founded fear of being persecuted for reasons listed here, also including gender, gender identity, sexuality. Um, and, and the key here, as we all know, is it's a legal definition and comes with it legal status, uh, access to Medicaid, et cetera. And, um, um, clearly a huge issue when we're taking care of immigrants from all over the world, some who are, um, many who are undocumented. Um, as opposed to asylum seeker, where the burden of proof is on the uh, asylum seeker to prove the refugee definition um, overseas when they present at a US border. And the problem with this is there's no visa for an asylum seeker. Um, although there's a small program called the Central American Visa Program that was started during the Obama administration, um, then um, um, not going on during the Trump administration and has, has 
started again, but it's a very small subset um, for Central, uh, Central American children. But basically the vast majority of immigrants who are fleeing war-torn areas who haven't been able to get um, asylum status or um, issues with political instability like in Haiti um, have no other means but to show up at a US border. And so what ends up happening as we all know is people are required to make these jaw droppingly treacherous journeys, you know, somehow make, making it, we see this all the time, patients uh, flying down to Chile or um, Argentina, saving money there, working, um, and then walking and making their way up to the US border and presenting that way. Clearly, um, this is an issue rife with um, assault risks and, and other things. And we see lots of unaccompanied children, and as we all know, who've been doing this. Um, this is the latest screenshot that I actually picked up this morning. I, this is one of my favorite um, geeky slides that I actually really like because it, it gives a whole geopolitical sense of what's gone on historically since 1975 with refugee admissions by region. And it really tells us sort of historically what's been going on with the fall of the Soviet Union, with Vietnam. Um, but I wanna highlight, you know, Latin America is in the aqua blue color. And you can see throughout this time that there are very few uh, Latin Americans who get and gain um, refugee status. It's, as we all know, it's a political definition as much as anything else because those arrival numbers as we've acutely seen during the Trump administration is based on presidential determination. Um, and so it, it's been a huge issue and you can see even that in 2021, um, our ceiling arrivals, um, this, is, this is data through the end of September, you know, um, are, we're not reaching anywhere near where we were um, pre-Trump administration at this point because all of the arrival infrastructure both overseas and with resettlement agencies was gutted during the Trump administ administration. Um, so everything is being rebuilt in real time as we're dealing with the Afghan humanitarian crisis. And, and it's made it very, very difficult um, for all of us who are doing this work because there's just not enough infrastructure after four years of, of no funding. Um, and then this is just data on what, what the annual ceiling is for refugee arrivals. And again, you can kind of map through the blue line is the annual ceiling that is uh, determined by presidential decree. So you can kind of read, <laughs> read between the lines here as to what happened during the Trump administration and what we're trying to get back up to um, when President Biden took, um, gained office. Um, you know, the goal this year is to get somewhere in the 60,000 range of arrivals, but as of July, you know, we were no, nowhere near there. Um, and then with the Afghan crisis, everything's been shifted to really focusing on Afghan arrivals. And as you probably know, the feds um, paused uh, refugee arrivals for everyone else who's been in um, waiting to come um, over the past four years um, so that we could all deal with the Afghan crisis just because it, it has been so difficult with lack of infrastructure. Um, which has made it very difficult for everyone else who is already in the queue. And then if you can, this is just looking at the um, largest refugee nationality by US state of initial resettlement. So for Colorado, where I am, um, Myanmar, we have a very large population. Illinois, I guess you guys have many Cubans, which I wasn't aware of actually. So I wanted to actually shift to cases because um, as you all probably practice pediatrics, I, I work and learn from my individual patients and then sort of take a step back and try to figure out how we can improve care sort of more on a, a global, from a global approach. Um, so I have two cases for you and they, they sort of contrast a little bit. Um, this is a, a, a girl from uh, Burma um, who presented to see me for a sports physical when she was 17 years old. Um, she came in with her mom, she speaks fluent English and her mom only spoke poke her in. Um, she arrived in the US from a Thai refugee camp 10 years ago. And the only reason I know this is because I asked. And I, I think this just focuses on the importance of talking to patients and getting a really good history um, and how important that is um, to get um, learners, residents and other people to, to, to continue to do this because 
it really affects um, a lot of um, things, as I'll show you. So she was born in a refugee camp at the Thai Burma border, but she'd been living in Colorado um, since then. And she was currently in 10th grade at a local high school where she was in all honors and AP classes. Um, she did, did not have refugee screening at my um, site that I run, and we couldn't track down her prior records from 10 years ago, which is incredibly common. And we have lots of people who come into Colorado, and I'm sure you guys have this in Il Illinois as secondary arrivals. And boy, it's really difficult to track down screening records from 10 years ago in another state even, um, where every state may be doing screening differently, which is problematic. Um, so I want to take a step back and just um, think about um, what standards there are in place for refugee screening and all the, the safeguards in place and um, double checks and um, physicians um, involved in this for um, six months before they even get on the plane. And I want you to contrast that with the, all the other immigrant populations you take care of who do have not gained that political status of refugee. And what that means and how that um, may affect sort of how you're seeing any immigrant in general. My argument being that all immigrants deserve the same type of screening because of actual prevalence data. So in, if you're a refugee, um, and, and I wanna also take a step back, the Afghan humanitarian crisis that's ongoing, none of them had this happen by definition. They didn't have six months to go through this. Most of them weren't given refugee status at this point. And so we're dealing with a very different subpopulation right now with the Afghan crisis because they, they came, had mostly humanitarian parolee status and none of this happened. And again, why we need to look, look at these guidelines and think about what we need to do for these patients and our um, immigrant children from Central America. So six months before departure, this is after this long arduous application, you fled your country, you're in a refugee camp or an urban area, you get um, refugee status, finally, after several years of proving that you're, you know, not a terrorist, I mean, it, it, it's quite, quite arduous. So six months before departure, there's an international organization of migration physician, usually a family medicine physician with probably around three to five years of training who will do a head to toe physical exam. Um, and they'll also get screened for what is deemed inadmissible health related conditions, which include active TB um, and, and other issues. Um, if active TB is identified, six months gives people plenty of time to actually treat, to get cultures, um, and to make sure that um, folks are not um, contagious when they got on a commercial airline to come to the United States. After all that happened six months before, as you're going through this whole process, three weeks before departure, you have another medical screening. Um, and then 24 to 48 hours but, but before departure are actually brought to, usually a week or two even before that, are brought to a hotel or, or some holding area where you're quarantined. And this has changed also with COVID, with COVID testing, vaccination, you're getting some vaccinations. Um, and also get um, a presumptive treatment because prevalence is so high for soil transmitted helmeth infections, um, malaria, if you're from Sub-Saharan Africa, um, and other um, medical issues. And I'll go through this in mo more detail. So this is kind of goes through what exactly is happening over that six month period before immigrants, refugees are coming to the United States. So um, kids two to 14 are getting an IGRO or a TST. Um, 15 and up are only getting a chest x-ray. They're looking for active TB. They're not dealing with latent TB overseas, unfortunately, at this point. They're tested for hepatitis B because of pro high prevalence. They initiate hep B vaccines for those who are um, uh, not infected. Um, the kids 15 and over and adults get tested for gonorrhea and chlamydia, syphilis. I wanted to note that HIV testing hasn't been done since 2010 because there was so much stigma associated with HIV and continues overseas that um, people felt that this should not be used as a criteria one way or the other of bringing someone in. If they're sick, it would be known that they have AIDS and they would be treated overseas, but otherwise everything happens once they arrive. They have a past medical history checklist. They get a full physical exam, but I put that in quotes because you know, GU exams don't happen usually unless there's an active issue. 
And a lot of the physicians overseas are not pediatric trained. I would say all of them are not pediatric trained. They're mostly family med physicians. And so I will say that um, there are things that are missed sometimes. And so needless to say, when you see someone new in your practice, you need to redo everything. Um, and then as I said, they get presumptive treatment. So why, why does this happen? Um, this is some data. This is um, you know, meta-analysis, pooled data um, back from 2003, looking at global prevalence of soil-transmitted helmet infections and why um, refugees overseas are getting presumptively treated with a dose of abendazole before they even get on the plane is because we're looking at ascaris whipworm and hookworm having um, jaw dropping high prevalence in children and adults and why we all know that kids get these deworming um, efforts when you know people come to their communities in rural areas. This is also some data specifically looking at refugee populations. And so this is not looking at um, kids from Central America. It's not looking at kids under two. This was done by uh, Bill Stoffer, a colleague of mine at CDC and um, University of Minnesota, um, looking at refugee populations who before 1999 were not getting presumptive treatment with abendazole before departure. And then the dark blue columns of getting presumptive treatment after May of 1999 and looking at ONPs um, once they arrived. And there was a significant drop in prevalence of ascaris hookworm and whipworm. And so the decision was made, and this is based on over 20,000 refugees that arrived to Minnesota, that this was very uh, cost effective um, and um, health saving, honestly, um, for, for refugee populations. So, so let's go back to this case. So um, I think I wanted to share some tools with you. Um, I think this screenshot of the AAP Immigrant Health Toolkit, I, I think, I mean, this is my biased opinion, I helped um, develop this with a couple other colleagues, is just a really good approach to getting a, a good thorough history from any immigrant. So, you know, getting immigration information perhaps waiting to get that information once you establish rapport and um, to make sure that the family understands the reason you're asking is actually to provide better health care and explaining that because of concerns around xenophobia. But you know, asking about whether someone was a home birth, their birth weight, a lot of times families will know birth weight, um, albeit probably not the most accurate because oftentimes in developing countries, birth, uh, birth weights might be done several days after birth. And we know what happens you know, when, when babies are born. But I, again, I think this gives it a nice approach. I also wanted to share, um, uh, this is from EPIC, um, the EMR that we use at Denver Health and most of the health um, systems uh, in Denver use. And this is an immigrant smart text encounter that we developed um, also in collaboration with Children's Hospital of Philly that also, also has um, a build um, and, and sort of our approach to how to do screening of any immigrant who shows up based on what we do in our refugee uh, clinic. And you can actually get uh, the build guides um, in the EPIC National Library. There's a community library. And if you search under immigrant or refugee, you can pull this up. So going back to our patient, um, when I saw her, I did a standard full physical exam. She's a new patient. Um, and to me, a standard physical exam is everything. So it's getting a blood pressure, doing vision and hearing. Um, and it, it, I, I say this, maybe it's sort of obvious to everybody, but stuff gets missed a lot. Um, or it was not passed on or diagnoses that were identified in screening aren't explained uh, appropriately to perhaps a newly arriving refugee. And we've seen this with data where patients are diagnosed with certain diseases where they're asymptomatic and they have no idea they have it. So I did, we did a full physical exam. We're looking, you know, it's an immigrant. We're looking for missed diagnoses. Um, I always in a physical exam with consent and a chaperone do an external genital exam because of issues that can be picked up for any patient, whether immigrant or not. We, we have a lot of um, female genital cutting um, in, uh, in subpopulations in Colorado. And so, um, but that's a whole other talk. Um, and, and then the other tool that you can use is something called CARE Ref, CARE Refugee. 
Um, and it's through the Center of Excellence in Refugee Health through Minnesota, but it actually is updated in real time with the CDC domestic refugee screening guidelines. And so um, this is the website and, and it's actually quite user friendly and you can actually use it in a room while you're seeing a patient. And basically you click on start care ref tool in that blue box and it kind of goes from there. And this is the screenshot. So I'm in Colorado. So I put down that that's where the patient resides that she came through um, Thailand, um, Burma via Th Thailand and her date of birth, et cetera. Um, and then it basically um, shoots out a, a checklist of uh, recommendations for screening. Okay. And so I'm not going to go through this ad nauseum. I'm just going to show you the screenshots of the recommendations per evidence that we have of prevalence data uh, from Im for immigrant populations of, of testing that should is recommended to be done. And so this is sort of what gives you an idea and it gives you, you can click on show more to get more information. It links back in, in real time to CDC as well. There's also translated materials and a link for that from Health Reach. Um, there's mental health guidelines, health profiles of certain subpopulations, et cetera. Um, and then based on this, we also developed, and you can get this out of the community library from Epic, if you use Epic, is an immigrant lab smart set. And so I'm just screenshotting that. Um, and then this is what we developed um, so that we're basically we're trying to teach um, providers how, how to take care of immigrants. We, none of us were trained. Uh, a lot of us, I know Meenal and I feel like this needs to be uh, a field of medicine, frankly, um, of, of how to approach a, a new immigrant coming to the US. And I don't think this is, is lumped into global health because this, these are immigrants to the United States. This is part of what we need to be doing for all, you know, any patient that we're seeing in the United States. So in this case, we did all of these tests. And, you know, again, she's been in the United States for 10 years, right? She's diagnosed with strongyloides. We did that by serology tuberculosis, um, unclear if active or latent, presumably latent TB because she has no symptoms and she's hepatitis B positive, okay? So, and all other labs are normal. And so, you know, the question, she had no idea that she had hepatitis B, had no idea that, um, uh, that, that this was an issue at all and had no symptoms. And in further history, mom was tested at US arrival for hepatitis B and was positive. And all of her um, children were not tested at arrival. And mom was lost to fallout for 10 years. And this is what we've seen actually in systematic evaluations, um, looking retrospectively at adult refugees in Colorado, where um, we looked at a cohort of 300 hepatitis B positive, adult, mostly adult refugees, who 98% um, who of them were lost to follow up. So I'd like to point out and stress there are some ethical decision making um, that needs to happen when you screen, because if you're going to screen and not do anything, then you might as well not screen. Um, and we've had actually some refugees die of hepatitis B known um, to our system um, from cirrhosis, but lost to follow up um, completely within our system. And I think that that is very problematic. So just taking a step back, this is a screenshot from the CDC domestic refugee screening guidelines. Again, that um, speaks in real time with CareRef. And you know, the recommendation is to screen all newly arriving refugees who are born in or have lived in countries with intermediate or high prevalence. Intermediate being 2% or more prevalence, which is basically every developing country out there. There's less data on Central America. There's some data um, and we'll go through that in a couple minutes. Um, and hepatitis B is a major global health pro pro uh, problem. It's a silent disease. And so people have it and are asymptomatic for the most part. Over a third of the world population is infected. There's over 127 million chronic carrier carriers and 65 million women of childbearing age, age are infected. And most of what we're seeing in immigrant populations is vertical transmission from moms who don't know that they're positive, who transmit to baby, baby's born overseas, kid comes to the United States as an immigrant, gets their hepatitis B vaccines here, and no one tests them, and they were already infected. And this is a silent population. We do not know how many are missed. 
um, and, and it's an issue as a pediatrician because we don't see the downstream effects of the 30 year old who presents with um, hepato, hepatocellular carcinoma or cirrhosis. Um, in 2016, only 10 and a half percent of patients were aware of their infection. Okay, so this, this is a huge issue. And the, uh, the other issue is, is that in acute infection, kids under five, as we know, less than 10% present with symptoms of acute infection. And even kids and adults five and over only 30 to 50% um, have any acute, acute symptoms. So most newly infected patients have no signs or symptoms of disease. And this slide actually, I really like, even though, you know, it's a slide with a graph, but with a light yellow um, line, you can see, again, symptomatic infection at birth. If you're vertically transmitted, no one is, is going to present with jaundice. And even as older uh, children and as adults who are infected, um, only upwards, as I said, of 40 to 50 percent. And you can see even kids who are horizontally infected after birth, they're not going to have any, any symptoms. And then the other thing that's really jaw-dropping as a pediatrician is to look at the orange line on the left. And of kids infected vertically, over 90% are going to develop chronic infection. And this is the population that we're completely missing. And this is, um, unfortunately, one of the most recent um, slides of data from 2006 from CDC showing at least what we think um, prevalence is, is in some countries. I think data is not fabulous coming out of Central America, but in our Northern Triangle countries, there is there is um, probably some intermediate prevalence. And um, I don't think we're doing a great job of screening these kids. This is a study um, <clears throat> that was uh, published in um, American Journal of Public Health by uh, Kate Yoon and, and other colleagues. Um, and we looked uh, in Colorado, Washington State, um, and uh, Pennsylvania. And um, we're looking at over 8,000 refugee children arriving from 2006 to 2012. And I'll be showing some other data from, from this study because it's the largest group of refugee children. And um, as you can see, um, prevalence for hepatitis B in um, patients coming um, from Burma via Thailand was 4.6%. That's pretty high. Um, the other thing I wanted to show you is the lovely screenshots from medical school that we all remember looking at. Um, and this is looking at strongyloides life cycle. As you, as you know, I, I, we mentioned that this patient had strongyloidiasis by serologic testing. Strongyloides is a parasite that is prevalent throughout developing countries, including Central America and all over the world. And basically it's a, it's a larva that um, um, you need skin contact with uh, um, dirt, soil that has strongyloides in it, and it's basically everywhere. So if you're walking barefoot, if you're an infant, a, a young child sitting, um, you know, without a diaper on, on, on dirt, um, uh, crawling, um, basically what happens is the larva um, penetrates the skin. Um, and goes through this whole life cycle that I'm not going to go through in detail, but I wanted to point out on the right hand side, the auto infection. And this is a pretty unusual thing for a parasite. What happens is you continue once you're infected to reinfect yourself. Um, and so there have been cases of people with strongyloides who've been infected for over 50 years. And if untreated, there are significant issues with hyperinfection syndrome because that's what we're kind of getting at here. You're asymptomatic, but if you become immunocompromised, um, as an adult, we see this, but not in children, um, you um, are at risk of hyperinfection sy syndrome. So you immunocompromise com someone, either they're immunocompromised because they're being treated um, with chemotherapy, prednisone, there've been case reports of women who've been put on betamethasone during pregnancy who developed hyperinfection syndrome. And the problem is, is the morbidity is significant and mortality rates reach about 50%. Um, and so this is looking at, as we know, in this case, um, this patient had um, TB and strongyloides. So it's go this is going back to Kate Yoon's study um, and it's showing for um, kids, uh, Burma via Thailand, a prevalence rate of 10, 10 and a half percent had TB. 
um, and strongyloides for 4%, um, 8% um, in the column with the arrow. And this is pretty ubiquitous. If you look at other countries here, we have Bhutan, um, DRC, Ethiopia, Iraq, and Somalia. And that's the populations that we were able to study. So I wanna um, go on to the second case. So this is an unaccompanied child um, from Guatemala um, who became an unaccompanied refugee minor. Um, and there's a very small subset of kids, very small, who end up getting refugee minor status. We're one site of 15 in the country that take care of unaccompanied refugee minors through a refugee clinic. Um, and they get the same treatment as all of our other refugees in the same screening. But what I wanna point out is, as you know, the vast majority of children coming in unaccompanied are not getting unaccompanied refugee minor status. They're being released from Office of Refugee Resettlement Shelters as undocumented uh, immigrants and don't get any of this. And so again, I wanna take a step back and really have you think about your approach to immigrant screening in general and how to teach that to other people. So this is a 16 year old girl from Guatemala. She speaks mom in Spanish. She was living with her grandma. Parents weren't involved. She left school at 11 years old to work. She was being recruited into a gang. So she fled and traveled by foot, bus and La Bestia, which is the train um, pictured at the bottom with an adult friend to the Southern US border. The friend was prevented from US entry. She was eventually taken into custody by ICE um, as an unaccompanied child and released to ORR custody and stayed in the ORR shelter for four months in Texas. I think we've all heard these awful stories. Um, she has no relatives in the US and qualifies uh, ultimately for special immigrant juvenile visa status. And she's flown to Denver, Colorado to live with a foster family as part of our ERM program. And she presents for a domestic medical examination at, at a refugee clinic, our, our clinic, and is brought in by her foster mom. I can tell you that in my regular practice, we have lots of these stories, but it stops where um, she qualifies for SIJV status and um, comes in and just presents with someone, and if you don't ask the questions, these questions, you're not gonna get the history and you're gonna, not gonna know that they're unaccompanied and it, it's a huge issue nationally. These kids are completely unidentified. Um, as we know, here's the Northern Triangle countries of Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras. Um, mostly um, kids are coming from Mexico and are sent back because of US law. You know, there's many from India, Brazil, now Afghanistan um, and everywhere else. And we all know the push-pull factors, um, reunification with family, abuse and uh, neglect, escape, uh, violence, and need, and need for access to education. Um, so further medical history um, was negative. She had not seen a physician in years until she was in ORR custody, um, uh, was born at home, had vaccines in Guatemala, but no records. Um, she had no meds. Uh, heads assessment um, with a foster mom not present. She denies any history of assault. I mean, she, this kid is at high risk and I just met her. And so the likelihood of her sharing some of this information with me and, and, and sharing it in an honest fashion is pretty low. We know that. And we know teens in general aren't gonna share this. Um, I, I bring this up because uh, I'll, we're gonna talk a little bit more about this. Her LMP was two weeks ago. She denies sexual activity because otherwise I'd be giving her emergency contraception if she was interested. She's heterosexual, denies drugs and alcohol. We obtain records from the ORR shelter in Texas and there's a link here to do so. It's not the most streamlined process, um, but her chest X-ray was read as normal because they really focus on TB. Um, so they do a really good job of TB screening. Um, her HIV was negative and she had two sets of vaccines given and that was it. So she had no other screening done and then was released, okay? So this, and I'm gonna go through this in a minute, this is the approach of ORR. This is ORR's unaccompanied children current screening form. Um, and I just wanna take a step back. Um, so, and, and COVID um, obviously has now been, been added to this. So I guess it's current with missed um, COVID information, but I wanna point out a couple of things. These are unaccompanied children and they are only testing children 13 and up for HIV or if they happen to tell you at intake within 48 hours when you get to the OR shelter, if you've been sexually active or abused. I want you to let that sink in. <laughs> 
They're only te they're testing um, kids 10 and up um, for pregnancy, so that's appropriate. They're doing old um, lead testing guidelines. They've changed, but they have um, through CDC. But these haven't been adopted through ORR. Lead testing through CDC is for any infant um, zero um, and up um, through six years old. Actually, I'm sorry, through 16 years old, and any um, immigrant who is pregnant or breastfeeding because of the risk to the fetus. Okay, so this is what's happening in the ORR shelters. They're only getting hepatitis B screening if they tell you you're, they're sexually active or using IV, IV drugs. I, I just really want you to let, I'm trying to let you get this to sink in. They're only testing for hepatitis C if, they're, if they tell you they're an IV drug user. And they're only testing for syphilis and gonorrhea and chlamydia if they say they've been sexually active or abused. We're missing vertically transmitted disease. We have no records on the mom. By definition, these are unaccompanied children. They do a great job of TB screening. Um, so in this kid, we do a full physical exam, the use, right? New patient, she's 16, uh, unaccompanied child now, an unaccompanied refugee minor in foster care. So she's very short. Her height is less than the fifth percentile. We do vision and hearing. We're doing everything. We're looking for anything that's been missed. Um, and if she consents, we're doing an external genital exam. If she's traumatized and is not comfortable, we make sure we document that it hasn't been done and that it will be done because I do this standardly in my practice for all patients because of missed diagnoses that we see in both boys and girls. Again, this is a screenshot of care ref. So I'm scrambling in my clinic to see this patient in 20 minutes or whatever it is. And so I go into care ref. If I don't know what guidelines there are to do screening and everything comes up and these are her results. So again, she was in an OR shelter for four months. She is anemic with microcytosis. She's got eosinophilia. Her lead level is normal. Um, she's got strongyloides. That's not being tested for at all in the OR shelters. She's got gonorrhea. She's got chlamydia. Okay. But she said she was not sexually active. As we know, in, in an unaccompanied child, they need to be tested. They're at so high risk of assault and, and abuse. Um, we test for syphilis, hepatitis B, C, pregnancy. We have the results from um, the ORR. And we also just presumptively treat her with a bendazole, given that we know that um, prevalence is pretty high and that she's been sort of exposed over time. Okay, so um, ORR does not do CVCs and DIFs. They would not have tested her for lead. They don't test for strongyloides. They would not have tested her for gonorrhea and chlamydia and the rest. And the issue is, is that since she's a refugee, she gets the screening, but the vast majority of these unaccompanied children are presenting in clinics across the country where no one is trained to do this. And so all of this is getting missed. I just wanted to give you a little bit of data. I'm sorry, this is a busy slide. This is unpublished data from the ERM program through ORR. Um, and it's showing you where kids are coming from um, oh, since 20, fiscal year 2011. And Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador hit that list most years. And this past fiscal year, all of the kids coming into the EARN program were from the Northern Triangle countries, okay? Most, the more are male than female, okay? That's the next um, table down. And these are the age ranges. So the vast majority are gonna be 17, just 18, um, where they're aging out. Um, and these are really low numbers because since 2011, so this is through fiscal year 2020, they've only um, pulled in 3,700 kids. That's it. We've had hundreds of thousands of unaccompanied children coming in from all over the world. Most of them did not get in this program. It's a problem. And the, I think um, because there's no really great data on unaccompanied children in general of their um, risks and what they could qualify with their stories regarding legal status. I think this ERM data um, really mirrors what we're, what we're seeing for the larger unaccompanied child population. And you can see this shift over time here to fiscal year 2020, where the bump in victims of trafficking, labor traff this is extreme trafficking, labor trafficking and or sex trafficking, and SIJV, which is a special immigrant juvenile visa where they've proven that they've been abandoned, abused and neglected and or neglected by parents, okay, or guardians. 
And this gives you an idea of where, what they're qualifying for. And I think this is what we're missing um, in all these kids that are being released. Um, most of them are not gonna get legal um, uh, representation by a, a, an appropriate lawyer to get legal status. And this is a huge problem. This is also, I think, mirroring what we're seeing in unaccompanied children. This is looking at unaccompanied refugee minors, a very small population. We're actually trying to get more data currently. This is a small sample from Michigan, Washington, and Colorado, of over, uh, close to 200 kids, 10 to 18, um, from 2012 to 2018. Um, looking at um, their prevalence rate of certain diseases, 23% had latent TB, and this is not just on a, um, um, children from Northern Triangle, 5% with hepatitis B, 2% with hepatitis C, unaccompanied refugee minors, HIV 2%, and needless to say, emotional distress 45%. And we compared that to non-unaccompanied refugee minor, refugee children and families, and they were um, statistically significant higher rates in unaccompanied children, I think by definition. So then taking a step back and saying, well, why is ORR not doing some of this screening? Well, I think it's cost, honestly, and I, I, I don't understand um, why. Um, and we've really been trying to convince people. And the only way that at this point that I've been doing it is giving talks like this. But um, I think, you know, they do do um, pregnancy testing. The recommendation is to do it 10 and up or anyone who's younger than 10 who's pubertal because, you know, uh, kids who haven't had um, menses might unfortunately already have been pregnant. And this is just showing my arrow here um, on the right is showing adolescent fertility rates for El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras. This is per a thousand. So, you know, Guatemala had 81 per a thousand ad adolescent fertility rate versus Mexico of 62 and se um, 17 for the US. So there's reasons to do it, even if they don't tell you that they've been sexually active. Vitamin supplementation is recommended. All children zero to six years of age should be placed on a multivitamin with iron and CBC and DIF should be done in all children. And this includes unaccompanied children. This is data showing moderate to severe stunting prevalence in kids under five and anemia in kids under five in the Northern Triangle countries. 29% in Honduras, El Salvador 14%, Guatemala, Guatemala 50%. And this kid, you know, was was stunted. You know, presumably um, she was less than five percent in terms for her height. Again, OR is not doing this. These kids get released, and then it doesn't ever happen. Um, and then sexually transmitted infections, um, syphilis. We're talking vertical transmission more than um, horizontal transmission. I think it's incredibly important to do on all children. Gonorrhea and chlamydia. Um, we're doing it 10 and up and younger if there are any concerns and HIV in all children really thinking about vertical transmission. And I have a screenshot here and highlighted in blue. This is from CDC. Um, although HIV prevalence is relatively low in Central America, um, minors arriving from Northern Triangle countries should be screened as maternal HIV status is likely unknown and vertical transmission is possible. And you can sort of look through this more, um, as I know this will be recorded, and you can get this off the CDC guidelines. Soil transmitted helminth infections is recommended um, treatment with abendazole or testing. And then strongyloidiasis, um, there's um, prevalence data in Central America is limited. Um, and there's really no data, great data out there on prevalence in US immigrants and refugees. This is an area that we've all talked about that needs to be studied. Um, and, and so at this point, the recommendation is to either presumptively treat with ivermectin, actually a real reason to use ivermectin as opposed to COVID, um, and, or to actually just test with serologies. Um, and then this is just um, the only study out there that's a meta-analysis that wasn't, it's, it's, it wasn't done very well because the testing was either by stool or serologic um, studies and stool samples for serologic for um, diagnosis of strongyloides is um, rife with issues and has lots of a high false negative rate. Um, but you know, Honduras definitely has prevalence. Um, I'm gonna end because we're in this Afghan crisis um, with one last case, um, and this is a quick one. So this is a six-year-old and a six, uh, and a, the picture here and her 16-year-old sister are from Afghanistan and they're seeing you in clinic for a so sore throat pre-COVID. And this is pre the crisis. 
They arrived in the US with their mother three months ago to reunite with their father who'd been working in the US for four years, okay? I just want you to look at this child's eyes. Um, she's beautiful, but she's got eye makeup on. It's called Surma. Um, there are different names for it in different countries and it's a coal-based uh, makeup um, that is used um, to, in infants, children, sometimes it's put on the eyebrows. Um, and also women use it, including pregnant women. And here's another picture of an infant from Afghanistan who has obviously more. I don't know if you all have seen children with um, coal makeup on their eyebrows. Um, in different countries, it's believed to prevent evil eye. In some cultures, um, it's believed to promote eye development. Um, and the problem is it's lead-based. Um, so full physical exam we do on this six-year-old, we do external genitalia like we do in all patients, it's nor normal for both of these patients, and you kind of know where I'm going here. Um, she's anemic, um, microcytosis, a bumped RDW, and her lead is 12. Her 16-year-old sister's venous lead is 15, and her mom's lead is 20. And Afghanistan has a very high prevalence of elevated lead levels in, in all comers. And so, um, and we do all the rest of the testing and we treat her and, and et cetera, give her a presumptive abendazole, et cetera. But I wanted to highlight this because if you're seeing Afghan arrivals, please get a venous lead. Infants, we had a three month old with a lead le venous lead level of 17, okay? These are not kids crawling around and mouthings, you know, as we were all have been taught. Uh, Afghanistan has uh, um, uh, lead, lead in their gasoline still, one of six countries that still does. They use products like Surma um, that gets absorbed into the skin, through the skin into the bloodstream, um, and then spices, pottery, um, home remedies, et cetera. So please check Venus lead, everyone zero to 16, anyone who's pregnant or breastfeeding. And this is just actually, we had someone do a home visit in this case. This was a spice that they brought from Afghanistan that had lead in it. Um, Surma on the right-hand side, the gold bottle, um, they dip, it's coal, they dip matchsticks into the coal and paint it on the eyebrows and around the eyes. It was 61% lead. And then this pot, um, they were putting water in and mixing formula with this. So that's where the three-month-old was getting elevated lead. Um, and I thought it was interesting that it says made in Afghanistan. And so all of that um, was um, taken away and there was explanations, et cetera, of what to do. So in summary, we're a country of immigrants. We all know this. When seeing an immigrant, please ask questions. Please teach your residents and medical students to ask questions and listen. How long have you been in the US? How did you get here? And always consider vertical transmission. There's no prenatal screening done in most resource poor areas. Um, no newborn lab screening labs. There's environmental exposure risks, micronutrient defici deficiencies and in infectious diseases. Um, and think about this um, and the region they're from when deciding approach um, to work up. And then finally, these are some resources for you. So this is the CDC domestic refugee screening guidelines. There's a link to care ref. Um, the Center of Excellence in Newcomer Health in Minnesota has great um, resources, webinars, um, lots of lots of information. Um, this is the um, Epic Community Library. You can look for um, how to get your sites to build um, smart sets and smart text. There's the AAP Council on Immigrant Child and Family Health, the Society of Refugee Health Providers listserv, and the North American Refugee Health Conference. And that's it. And thank you.